Today, we embark on a journey from the quadratic to the cubic, a journey that will reveal not just how to solve equations, but how the very structure of mathematics emerges from our attempts to find solutions. Our goal today is not to recall formulas that you've memorized, it's to discover them, to invent them from scratch. We're going to solve equations by doing something extraordinary. We'll invent entirely new number systems and define their rules to serve our purpose. This is mathematics as creation, as art. We begin with our first quest, solving quadratic equations. To do this, let's invent an abstract symbol. We'll call it R. Our new numbers will have this form, Q equals A plus B times R, where A and B are ordinary real numbers. But R is something new, something undefined. We have the power to give it meaning. So let's impose a rule, a rule that will serve our quest. We declare that R squared equals A plus B times R. This is the foundation of our new world. Now that we've created this system, we need to understand how it behaves. We need its algebra. Addition is straightforward, component-wise and intuitive. When we add a1 plus b1r to a2 plus b2r, we simply add the components, a1 plus a2 plus b1 plus b2 times r. But multiplication, multiplication requires our new rule. When we multiply a1 plus b1r times a2 plus b2r, we expand this normally. But here's where our rule becomes essential. Wherever we see r squared, we replace it with a plus br. After applying this rule and collecting terms, we get a1a2 plus b1b2a plus the quantity a1b2 plus b1a2 plus b1b2b times r. Our system is algebraically consistent. Now comes a bold assumption. Let's assume that our abstract symbol r can actually be represented by a complex number. We write r equals p plus qi, where p and q are real numbers and i is the imaginary unit. We substitute this into our fundamental rule, r squared equals a plus br. When we expand the left side using p plus qi squared and equate it to the right side, we get p squared minus q squared plus 2pq times i equals a plus bp plus bq times i. By equating the real and imaginary parts separately, we obtain a system of two equations. From the imaginary part, 2pq equals bq. From the real part, p squared minus q squared equals a plus bp. From the first equation, if q is not zero, we can divide both sides by q and immediately find p equals b over two. Now we substitute p equals b over two into our first equation. After some algebra, we find that q squared equals negative b squared plus four a all divided by four. Let's define d as b squared plus four a, the discriminant. For q to be real and non-zero, we need d to be negative. When d is negative, q equals plus or minus the square root of negative d over two. And so the identity of r is finally revealed. r equals b over two plus or minus the square root of negative d over two times i. Look at this parabola. This is the graph of x squared minus x plus one. Notice that it never touches the x-axis. There are no real solutions to this equation. This is why our journey into the complex plane was not a luxury, it was a necessity. Some quadratic equations simply cannot be solved without leaving the real number line behind. Now we claim our prize, the quadratic formula itself. For a general quadratic, alpha x squared plus beta x plus gamma equals zero, we divide through by alpha and rearrange to match our system's rule x squared equals negative gamma over alpha plus negative beta over alpha times x. This means a equals negative gamma over alpha and b equals negative beta over alpha. Substituting these values into our solution for r, we derive the famous formula, x equals negative beta plus or minus the square root of beta squared minus four alpha gamma, all divided by two alpha. We haven't just recalled this formula, we've invented it. We've derived it from first principles by creating a number system designed to solve our problem.
But now, a new mountain looms before us. Can this elegant method conquer the cubic equation? Let's try. We define a cubic number system with a new symbol, j. Our cubic numbers take the form w equals a plus bj plus cj squared. And we impose the corresponding rule for a monic cubic, j cubed equals a plus bj plus cj squared. Surely, if this worked for quadratics, it should work for cubics. Once again, we assume j can be represented as a complex number, j equals s plus ti. We substitute this into our cubic rule, j cubed equals a plus bj plus cj squared. We expand j cubed using the binomial theorem, separate real and imaginary parts. The imaginary part gives us 3s squared t minus t cubed equals bt plus 2sct. The real part gives us s cubed minus 3st squared equals a plus bs plus c times s squared minus t squared. Two equations, two unknowns. But when we solve for t squared from the imaginary equation and substitute it back into the real part equation, something unexpected happens. We don't get a solution. Instead, we get another cubic equation, this time for s. 8s cubed minus 8cs squared plus 2c squared minus 2b times s plus a plus bc equals zero. Do you see what's happened? We have not simplified the problem. We have only transformed one cubic into another cubic. We're walking in circles. This is a dead end. Why did this happen? The answer lies in the structure of algebra itself. The quadratic system is two-dimensional. When it's irreducible, when it has no real solutions, it becomes a field, the complex numbers, C. The cubic system is three-dimensional, but crucially, it is not a field. Solving the cubic requires more than just square roots. It demands cube roots, something our two-dimensional complex number map simply cannot provide. Sometimes the most profound lessons come not from our successes, but from understanding exactly why we failed. The true structure of polynomial solutions is described by something called the equation's Galois group, a deep concept from abstract algebra. The quadratic equation has a Galois group of order two. It needs square roots, which the complex numbers can provide. The cubic equation has a Galois group of order six. It needs both square roots and cube roots. And the quintic? The quintic has a Galois group of order 120, but this group is not solvable, which is the mathematical reason why no general formula using radicals exists for fifth degree equations or higher. This is one of the most beautiful and surprising theorems in all of mathematics. Today, we've seen how inventing a number system can elegantly derive the quadratic formula, a formula you may have memorized, but now understand from its foundations. We discovered that the cubic equation's complexity requires a more powerful algebraic structure than we initially imagined. And perhaps most importantly, we learned that the failure of a simple, elegant method can be more instructive than its success. Our failed attempt to solve the cubic revealed something profound about the nature of mathematics itself. As the closing quote reminds us, the quest to solve equations is the story of discovering the very structure of numbers. Thank you for joining me on this journey.